Are we here? The bird calls. The gentle breeze. The breathing. Is it here? The breathing, the bird calls. The breeze. One total being here. Or is it divided into me, the listener, Tony sitting here, and the wind outside. Inside is the hall, outside is the pictured trees. One can see the leaves trembling. Is it all one undivided whole? And if not, what divides it? Do we feel cut off, separate? <coughs> Why? What makes for this felt sense of cut offness, of separateness? as the birds are twittering. A breath is taken. We talked about it a bit the other night. Someone saying something like, Yes, I do feel separate. This is me sitting here, me, Franny, sitting here. This is how I felt it all my life. Are we open to questioning this feeling all one's life? really only be truly observed out of a moment of no separation, which is often not even conscious. It's just no separation, no thought stirring about me inside and everything else going on on the outside. That's thought creating the division. Sitting, sitting here, before the thought, Tony is sitting here, or whatever all our names are, before that thought arises, again, right now, it's just a body, which is already an abstraction, a series of sensations, feeling the bottom against the chair and the throbbing in the foot, the voice, the breathing, it's hot, warmth, and birds. All of this is happening. And to that, we give the name Body Sensations and Tony. Collection of sensations and thoughts about them, naming them, and attaching to that, identifying with that as me sitting here. And not noticing that it is thought and abstraction and memory. Stringing it all neatly together. What is actually intermittent, there's not continuous thinking, I'm here as Tony or Franny. At times there's a moment of watching or listening, attending. And then the thought arises, oh, I'm attending. Or I didn't attend. I should have. Can we just follow it, watch it, 
observe it kindly, gently, from no point of view of what should be, but with some curiosity about what is. Does the thought, I am sitting here, Tony is sitting here, does it feel real? How real can a thought feel? Aided, of course, by physical sensations, which are also identified as mine, my feelings, my emotions, my thoughts. Can we question the whole thing? By questioning, not meaning making mantras out of questions. We'll come to that in a moment because it's been asked in meetings but not taking it for a fact, wondering about it. Whether there is really separation and what makes for it. Or one may say, no, I, I don't need to investigate this. It's, it's clear to me that I am here as this body. It's so palpable. So real. And what's real is all the ideas and memories and sensations about it. What if we changed our thinking? Maybe even deliberately. Changed our thinking from thinking I'm a separate body with an owner in there and a doer, a thinker, an actor, changed our thinking to everything is happening in concert. Everything is happening together. as one whole movement of consciousness. No one separate from it, each one of us, the whole thing. What if we began to just think about it that way? We may not, we may not realize that it is so, but does a changed way of thinking affect our perceptions. You can experiment with it. And the question is, will one now dwell in the new framework of thinking and think more about it and feel inspired by it and then turned off by it? Or will the thinking be like a hypothesis? Let's test it out. Is it really so? I don't know. But in, in listening, and the wind stirring in the leaves, and the breath, and the voice, who's doing it? I can say, well, I'm doing it. I'm giving a talk. But I don't think that way. There are words coming out of seeing, of listening, of attending, with memory aiding, with a language, with examples. There's no one doing it. I don't think that way. And therefore nothing, no phantom appears. <clears throat> so maybe one either starts from inside, that there is no one there, that everything is happening on its own, or one starts from thinking in a new way and wondering whether it is really so. Not rejecting it out of hand or saying, well, this is just theoretical for me. Not realizing that I am separate is also theoretical. This, this body here is nourished by the whole earth. 
the food, the water, the sunshine, the wind and air, which means the solar system, the galaxy, the whole universe is sustaining it. So is this body the whole universe? Everything that sustains it is also it, isn't it? That makes logical sense. But not just logical sense. It drops this pain of separation from which all of us suffer. At times we think we benefit from it. But then the benefit turns into loss. There's incredible power to thought. Our perceptions are influenced and controlled, distorted by what we think. If we think somebody's an enemy, we will meet them differently than if we think they look friendly. Sounds as though I was suddenly changing my line, saying create new thoughts, create new ideas and images. It was just something that arose for a moment. Why cling to a certain set of ideas about ourselves, experiment with changing it around and see what happens. And not just say, why, it's just too abstract, too theoretical. Several people brought up the whole matter of questioning. saying not everybody put it the same way but we'll just have one presentation for simplicity's sake saying when there is real quiet sitting peaceful sitting maybe only a few thoughts then why question? Or should I be questioning? Or, one person put it, the mind doesn't want to question. It is afraid of losing this beautiful, blissful quietness. What does one think questioning is? Since we talk so much about it and on the sign which was stolen from us, it said a place for meditative inquiry. Now that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have a different sign if we ever put another one up. <clears throat> What's there right now is really something. <laughs> have you seen it? <laughs> it doesn't go with our neat aesthetic appearance. <laughs> sort of a cardboard stuck in crooked. <laughs> Questioning the whole thing. Because <laughs> it was straight when we first arrived. Maybe somebody, I don't know what happened. It's <laughs> so this thing of inquiring, questioning has become sort of a household word here. People 
reminding each other to question it. You've got to question that at times when we have a meeting or so. What, what do we mean by questioning? Or shall we first look at what questioning conventionally has meant? And I think we can all agree <clears throat> that in our daily a relationship with each other in school, being taught, teacher asking questions and you have to give an answer and the answer is either right or wrong. The speed with which the answer comes has to do with the grade you get, the faster the better. That's one way of questioning. Coming up with the answer and this is what the brain is very used to. The question is asked and it searches. Okay? speedily in the files for the answer. Even if it doesn't come up with an answer right away and one gets distracted and thinks or does something else, pop, all of a sudden the brain has found it and the, the answer comes to the mind, the name one has forgotten or whatever. And we were plenty rewarded as children, A, for asking questions, we could sometimes engage an otherwise disinterested parent in us by asking questions. And maybe the parent thought, oh, this child is really curious. Maybe the child just wanted to maintain contact and found this was one way of getting it. Why, why, why? So we have gotten attention or praise for asking questions and of course, good grades for answering them well and quickly. So this kind of questioning that we're talking about here and maybe engaging in goes contrary to this whole conditioning. Not contrary, it doesn't go against it, it is not of that kind. Because Usually the questions we end up with are not questions that can be answered from the storehouse of the brain. Answers are not registered about who am I, what am I, what is the meaning of life, what is death, what is love. What is this holding on or attaching? What is identification? It's not to be answered quickly or at all in a con conventional way. So can we get used to a new way of questioning, not quite knowing how, but beginning with realizing it's not the usual thing of searching for answers quickly. Maybe that has to precede it. The brain will not give up as long as it thinks it can answer the question. So let it do that and watch it patiently, or is one getting involved in it, in the search and expectation of answers? It can all come sooner or later into awareness, which doesn't judge, it just illuminates. The search has not satisfied, has not brought up any answer of what I am, for instance. This is not my point question or main question. We're using it. The brain can't answer it. Or maybe one is satisfied with what one has read, abstracted. Then there will be no questioning in the sense we're talking about here. If the brain is satisfied and the body with it, they go together. But if there's no contentment, no 
satisfaction. There's still a restlessness, a uncertainty, a yearning to find out, then a question, whatever it may be for each one of us, will just sit there in a vast field of not knowing. Not knowing what the meaning of life is, not knowing what one is, not satisfied with thinking I'm this body and mind and my history and my possessions and talents and so forth, not satisfied with this anymore, wondering whether there's more or something else to oneself than what one has assumed up till now is oneself. Then a question goes into not knowing, asks into not knowing, coming out of not knowing, into not knowing, one not knowing, and yet wondering. And in that wondering, in that curiosity, things about ourselves, alone and in relationship, reveal themselves, in the light of the question. It happens that way. And even what reveals itself in relating to each other, the angers or fears one has never quite owned, denied or looked away from and seeing them, being with them. A question comes up again, well, is that all? Somebody said that recently. I don't know where it was or what the occasion was. When I faced my anger, then I was whole. Something I had never faced before. All my life, it was always shoved in the closet, not allowed to be expressed. And finally, expressing it and feeling it and being with it, seeing it, I felt whole. What is wholeness? This is a question. All of my up till now not quite acknowledged or witnessed faculties and emotional qualities putting it all together, now this is, this is me, this is the whole. Sooner or later there will be some nagging doubt whether this is the whole thing. And with the doubt comes a new question which may not even be verbalized or verbalizable. Wondering what is the whole thing? And letting go of knowing it is it possible. Asking, do we understand each other about asking into not knowing? Somebody recently said, but I know, I know that I don't know. But not knowing is not a knowing. It is not knowing. Everything that comes up as the known is put aside. It's not this, it's not this, it's not this, and this it is also not. Then what's left? When it's nothing that can be known, meaning mulled over, produced, filed, recorded in the brain and body. that somewhat clearer, a new kind of questioning into not knowing, holding the question, but not demanding the answer. When one's whole being becoming the question which is not knowing. The 
Does that sound abstract? Take it. If it is abstract, take it as that. And wonder, what does the abstract refer to concretely? And not know. Coming back to someone, and there's not an isolated case at all, someone saying, there was this incredible sitting, just the rain, just the rain, quiet, peaceful, even one could say ecstatic. And yet some kind of a feeling Not to, not to move much in this. It could collapse. This could raise a lot of questions, couldn't it? Even though one feels there are no questions. One doesn't want to question because that could collapse this beautiful space of silence. But let me just say that a true space of silence, of awareness, is not collapsible by asking a question about it. By asking whether there is there somebody who is upholding this. It's an innocent question. It's not an accusation. Not on a fault-finding trip. Just watching, wondering, inwardly, is there a doer, a creator, a maintainer of this silence? Ask the question and then leave it. Let the answer reveal itself by itself. Because if the answer comes immediately, no, 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 there is no one here, that may be very theoretical, Wish, wishful thinking. Asking and sort of very finely, subtly listening inwardly, one will come upon this so called doer, an effort to keep it, not to touch it, not to rattle it. Which is the experiencer wanting to continue their experience, which is a division. me and my experience, it may not have been that coarse, it may have been much more subtle. But in, in talking about it, it was recognized, it was realized. And the, the, the amazing thing is, when in this way of questioning and looking inwardly, it may be discovered that this Silence need not be maintained or controlled. It opens up that much wider and larger and deeper if the controlling ends by being discovered. Are we together a little bit? You can use meetings to bring it up again freshly. If it is of interest. And as I started out, that's really a neat new thing. Don't say, oh, this is too abstract for me. It's not so for me. Well, just take it for whatever you understand. Maybe it's helpful in some unimaginable way. When I used to read many years ago certain books, quotations, some of them hit so strongly. Not that I understood what was being talked about it, but they hit nonetheless. How could anybody say this? Where are they coming from? There was never the 
tendency to say, oh, there's a lot of hogwash or rubbish. Uh, impossible. They know what they're talking about. I must have gotten the right books. <laughs> it's always... Hearing something, not just going with the old battle axe habit to fight it, to an, annihilate it or deny it or, or whatever, but give it the benefit of the doubt. Keep it in your heart. The, the brain may refuse it. At this, at this point in time, the next moment it may be crystal clear or I may not have said something very clearly or maybe wrong. Please uh, point it out to me. This is open for dialoguing, questioning together. That's one of the most beautiful things two human beings can do together, or more than two. Look at the same thing at the same time. with the same intensity, that's how Krishnamurti always used to put it. Same place, same time, the same intensity. And there's no alienation, no division, no fight. We can look at everything. And there need to be no defense and no attack in this looking together. And an enormous wellspring of energy and goodness can use the word freshly. We didn't get to the topic of responsibility the other day. And I said, we'll do it after the free day. We'll get to it. Somebody called me on it, said, I'm leaving tomorrow. I won't hear this talk. Please say something about responsibility in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but we still had a good meeting after saying, I can't give a talk right now. Let me, let me know what you want to look at. And then the well flows. So, responsibility. It's a big topic in our upbringing, not that we live so responsibly necessarily, but we are taught and told to be responsible. Meaning what? We should take control of our actions, see them through, yeah, carry them through to the end, not break off in the middle. What is all this business of taking responsibility? Oh, I know in what connection it often comes up in and during, in between retreat talks. The fear that if there is no one there in this open space of listening, won't all kinds of immoral acts happen? Amoral. What, what will be the guideline to our actions? Well, I think we can all agree that even with thousands of years of guidelines, all kinds of immoral actions are taking place. <laughs> we live that way. Not all of us all the time. Also, again, hanging on to this assumption that unless there is somebody in here, in this body-mind, 
who takes responsibility, things will go awry. But what, what do we really mean by taking responsibility? Keeping the image of myself as a responsible person hanging in there and, and trying to live up to it, to the image, to the uh, commandment. Doing something over all kinds of resistances or um, just to be, to fulfill this image of being a responsible person. We can look at it all, whether this is what's going on. Let's first, see, we can't even discuss this unless we really break this whole thing down. Who is the responsible doer? What, who is that? And not get stuck in the assumption that there is someone in here who can do that. This wor work of meditative inquiry is about questioning and looking, not just questioning at infinitum, but looking. What is this what I have assumed to be the responsible doer? And as one puts the magnifying glass on the processes which lead to so-called responsible action, one will, will see all manner of thought trains available in the brain. Should I do this? Shouldn't I do, do this? I should do this. It would be good to do this because then this will not happen or that will happen. And this is what should happen. I don't want that to happen. There, there's all kind of thinking and imaging, projecting, imagining outcomes that go with our conventional idea of a responsible doer. Is, is there no doer but just thoughts and recordings from the past, values of what is good and helpful to others maybe? Is that all there is? Arrays of thoughts, sometimes fighting each other and then the weightiest one wins out and leads to action. That, that is one thing that needs to be observed firsthand, that thoughts indeed and pictures and stories and convictions can bring about action. It needs no doer. The thought leads to action or activity. To find that out firsthand, then maybe this deep assumption that beside the thoughts there's also a thinker of the thoughts or a doer of the deeds will melt in the light of observation of what's actually happening. I've often mentioned this when, when it first occurred to me to, to watch what goes on in the morning when one wakes up a little early or right around the right time. Should I get up or should I stay in bed? And all the thoughts and feelings and, and, and sensations. It's so nice and it never feels so nice and warm and cuddly until the moment one has to get up in the middle of the night. If one can't sleep, it doesn't feel that way. So wanting to prolong that, just like wanting to pro prolong the silence, wanting to stay with the sensations, which may not be all verbalized, but the, the body also thinks in sensations. And then the thought, well, if I get up a little bit earlier, I can dress a little bit slow and do a few more exercises. And on and on. And then suddenly one gets up. <laughs> I say one gets up. I better say a foot is out and then the other one. Or the blankets are pushed back and the exercises start. Can say I started them, I decided now to start the exit. That's much too complicated. That's not how it is. It's thinking and then thought leading to doing or, or letting go of all the thoughts and beginning to exercise. So 
So watch it. The, this, this holy cow we have of free choice. God given free choice, free will. It still is open to observation, is it? If God gave free will, he also gave this power of observation. But I'm not saying these things, really. <laughs> so, back to responsibility. I noticed this morning, Marlise was hanging out the cover of the deck lawn chair over the bench, and I speculated, I may be wrong, that it was left out in the rain. Was it? What thoughts went through the mind? <laughs> These irresponsible people. I'm not talking for you, I'm talking for myself. I had the same thought pop up first thing. Not, it, it didn't last very long, because I'm talking about responsibility today. So let's look at it. What goes on in leaving out the cover of the deck chair. We could now conventionally say, well, who was the last one to use it? He, she, is responsible. But how does the last one know he's the last one? Didn't think that way, just got up, went inside, forgot all about it, and didn't look back out when the rain started falling. Maybe it was sleeping. It was in the night that the rain started falling. So when do we, quote, unquote, take responsibility, and when do we not? Or when does this take place, this thing? I much prefer recently not to say taking responsibility, but looking at this responsibility the ability to respond. And the ability to respond is optimal when we're not all caught up with ourselves and therefore don't see the rain or the deck chair. Because if we're sleeping, we're caught up in dreams or whatever. But the ability to respond is optimal when the self doesn't occupy the stage, at least not completely. There's some room to see other things beside my needs, my benefits, my, my pains, or my worries. There's some space, and in that space, space appears the cover of the deck chair out there. And it doesn't matter who stayed on there last, and picks it up and takes it in. And are there further thoughts? I am really a responsible being here. Maybe the only one here who's responsible. <laughs> That's already taken up with oneself and one doesn't see something that could also be taken care of. so much morals and weightiness attached to this. So we have to watch it very carefully or uh, uh, discover it very gently, this imagery about being responsible and others not, or others are and I'm not. And let it go. So the, the, the vision is clear to see what needs to be done. And when something is clear, clearly needs to be done, there's usually the energy to do it. And when the energy is there to do it, it's even fun doing it. Because being here is fun. It's joy, it's presence, and not the worry of tomorrow or yesterday. Then if, if in this the, the, the thought arises, oh, I'm so responsible, one laughs at these habitual mushroom thoughts sprouting up. Caw, caw, caw. 
does it better than I do. <laughs> so, I don't think responsibility needs to be a problem when the vision is clear, or at least partially clear. The, the whole history of emergencies here in this country is incredible emergencies that, that happened, this heat wave, this extraordinary heat wave in Texas. When I was home last Wednesday, which was yesterday, I listened to the news. And wonder of wonders, the electric companies have decided not to turn the electricity off on people who can't pay it, because the, the whole system is so overloaded with air conditioning and fanning and all kinds of other things. People, even doctors, have driven air conditioners to patients or had their employees do it. Now these are marvelous, amazing things in the society of which we think it has no heart left, all profit, all money, all power. But let an emergency happen and something awakens in us, which is a mitmenschlich, what do you say, being with each other in the same pot, same melting pot, and helping each other, understanding how the other suffers because one is in it oneself. And all kinds of creativity, how to alleviate the problem. So a lot of responsibility taking, but not so much out of the idea I ought to, but out of compassion, feeling with each other. So many people have, have said this in the course of their particular <clears throat> emergency, earthquake or flood, drought, fires. More important than the fire and losing the house was that I discovered I had neighbors who were helping each other, talking with each other. <coughs> Our son said this after this <clears throat> Northridge Earth earthquake in Los Angeles. He said, we'd never had time to, to, to talk, to see each other, neighbors. They were just in and out on two cars or three cars. And here, cooking out together and talking with each other, discovering another human being like oneself. some leisurely context because the highways are broken down one can't go to work. It's gotten late. We will end here for today.